Good morning, church. Today's scripture is taken from Acts. There will be two passages. Chapter 9, verse 23 to 27. I shall read for us. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul, on his journey, had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he was preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. The next scripture is taken from Acts chapter 11, verse 22 to 26. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas to Antidot. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we invite uh, Pastor Raymond to come and share God's word today. A very good morning to everyone. Yeah, I just want to share today's uh, topic on mentoring the next generation. And our sister has read the scriptures for us today. Maybe you can, the slides, uh, you may need to go to the PowerPoint. You know, I would like to begin by sharing with you that my wife went, or there was many, some years back, my wife went on a, on a work trip. Uh, her company sent her to Korea. And so... I get the privilege to go along with her because she got a single room. So I just buy a ticket and I can go holiday with her. Yeah? Uh, while she works, I holiday a bit first. Then after that, we extend and uh, continue to um, explore Seoul uh, in Korea. And when that was my very first time that I went to Korea. And we, we told ourselves when we were in Korea, we must visit the biggest church in the world. You know, the biggest church in the world is in Korea, so uh, uh, pastor, that last time, Pastor David Cho Yonggi was the pastor of the biggest church in the world, Yoido Full Gospel Church. Yes, this is Yoido Full Gospel Church, and I was sitting there, and I was taking a photo uh, of the front, you know, of the church. Um, the, of course, they speak in Korean, uh, so... Uh, where I sit is where they do the translation and we have a, a, a earpiece to put into our ear to listen to the translation in English. So, they, you know how big is Yoido uh, gospel, Full Gospel Church? One million members. Every Sunday, uh, Saturday weekend, from Friday night all the way to Sunday, there'll be one million people coming to church, okay? Of course, they take turns to come to church. Every two hours, change. Every two hours, change to make sure that one billion people attend church. And they had two halls. And so, one, the hall that I went to, the building that I went to, this hall can take 30,000 people. Amazing. And, and we were there. And the church, we, when we were there, it was so big and vibrant. And, you know, I, I, I asked this question, you know, how is it, you know, that this, this church can be so, so big, you know, so huge, so many members. Then, I, when I went there, I saw why the church is so big and vibrant. 
it is because they believe in prayer. They believe in prayer. They were at, they were at least in the service, uh, the worship service alone, there were seven sections in the order of worship where they took time to pray. And they, they prayed here, they prayed there, they prayed for their church, they prayed for the world, they prayed within the worship service. They even have a prayer mountain after that. I heard that they had a prayer mountain. The church actually bought a mountain in Korea. And they, are, they get their members to go for a prayer retreat on the mountain. Wow, amazing. And, and spend a few days, a month, just to pray and fast in a mountain. Yeah, Moses met God in a mountain, right? Yeah, and these Koreans will go up to the mountain to pray. But you know what? I know, I, I realize that there is a downside to this big church as well. Because when I was there and I look around, I realized most of the church members were middle aged and white hair, senior citizen. <laughs> yeah, most of them, almost 90% of them, all white hair and middle aged and old aged senior citizen. There were very few young people in the church. And after service, Ruth and I, of course, as a tourist, we went for lunch uh, in the shopping mall. Uh, in Seoul, and there we saw all the young people. They were all at a shopping mall. They were not in church on Sunday morning. Yeah? And I asked myself, why is it so? You know, what is happening to the Korean church? And my answer is this, is that the parents or even the, the, the church was not mentoring their children. The church was not mentoring the young people. The people had not taken up the responsibility to disciple and mentor the young generation. We do not want to end up like the Korean church, right? SACC. And that is why mentoring the next generation must take priority in our vision. You know, during the World War II, in, South, in the South Pacific, some of the members of the navigators tapped on a young marine shoulder and, and, and they took this young man aside and he, they shared the gospel with him. They took him under the care and they, they even discipled this young man. And that young man went on to become a pastor, a speaker and a best-selling author. And we all know him actually if you are a reader. His name is Charles Swindle. Yes, Pastor Charles Swindle. And that is the power of mentoring and discipling. When you disciple, when you mentor someone, who is young, he grow up, he will become even a man of God. And this is the power that what mentoring and discipling can do. Before we can even mentor somebody here, I guess most, a lot of you uh, will be thinking, Pastor Raymond, I'm not that standard, la. I cannot mentor people, right? I think that's in your mind, some of you. You know, thinking, ah, yeah, who am I to mentor a young, younger person? But let me tell you, you can. But first, you must be mentored yourself. So, before even we go on, one biblical character in the Bible that graphically portrays the makeup of a mentor is a man called Barnabas. Everybody say Barnabas. And he's found in the book of Acts. And I hope that you will note the qualities of a mentor like Barnabas and you will go and look for yourself a mentor who will mentor you and disciple you so that later on, you yourself can mentor another young person on, in, this, in, this, uh, in this church. You know, there are five qualities that I want to share with you in the time that I have uh, about Barnabas, that Barnabas demonstrated as a mentor. And, and these are the five qualities that we will go straight into. Number one, Barnabas was generous to others. The word is generous. Everybody say generous. Generous. Yes, Barnabas was generous to others. Acts chapter 4, verse 36. And he says here, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, he sold a few he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. You know, the place 
is the upper room. There were 120 people gathering there. The time was right. The Spirit descended and Peter stood and preached and thousands embraced the risen Christ. Amongst the members of the early church was a man by the name of Joseph from Cyprus. And this faithful believer realized that the, the church needed funds uh, uh, to sustain the thriving work of evangelism. And so out of his own volunteerism, his own accord, he sold off one of his property. And he sold off that land that he has and gave the proceeds to the apostles so that the evangelism can go on in a tremendous way. The apostles were so encouraged by Barnabas' action that they named him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. You know, the first mark of a mentor is generosity. From experience, I can affirm you that since the day I took up mentoring, the day I started discipling people as a ministry, I've become poorer since. <laughs> yes. Because I realized Barnabas is a generous person and I need, as a mentor, I need to be generous myself. As a mentor, you must be prepared to be generous in terms of time, resources, because time, you need to spend time and train the, the, the disciples that you have. Resources, you need to give them resources so that they can also uh, minister and, 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 and serve the Lord. And emotions. Generous with emotions as well. To, to listen to them and to, to encourage them. And of course, finances as well. To give them a treat, you know. To bring them out for lunch. Yeah. And what I have learned is that generosity is a learned behavior. Everybody say learned behavior. Yeah. Because we are all naturally selfish. Don't you think so? Yes. We are all naturally selfish. But it is interesting to know that in the early church, it was great grace that led to great gratitude. And because of gratitude, which in turn give rise to great generosity, that we, we start to learn the habit of generosity and we start to give and we start to bless others. Number one, a mentor is generous. Number two, he, is, he believes in you. Everybody say, believes in you. Yes, Acts chapter 9, verse 26 to 27. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him, not believing that he was a really a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. You know, the, at that time, the early church was growing very fast. The religious leaders were upset with this new way. And one of the most intense rabbis against Christianity was a man by the name of Saul. Saul was against Christianity and he was persecuting. He took it upon himself to task the task of getting rid of the Christians. He started persecuting the church. He was the first missionary against Christ. Not for Christ, but against Christ. Then came the Damascus Road experience. He was totally turned around and transformed. And from the greatest missionary against Christ, he became the greatest missionary for Christ. News of this reached the, the apostles' ears, but none of the apostles believed that Saul was a changed man. They were even afraid that he's going to come and he's going to kill all the Christians and the apostles. You know, so they, they would say, ah, yeah, he must be faking it, you know. It is his trick to infiltrate into the church so that he, he, he will come in as a secret agent and he will kill every one of us. Yeah, that's what the, the apostles must be thinking. So when Paul arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas was the only one who met and provided for Paul's needs or Saul's needs. He vouched for him. And when everyone is not for Saul, Barnabas believed in him. A mentor believed in you. In other words, 
Barnabas was a sponsor to Paul. And we all need sponsors in our ministry, in our lives. Charles Allen once told a story about a beggar who was sitting outside an art studio. And the artist had an inspiration and started to paint the beggar. And just as he was about to finish, he went up to the beggar and asked him to come over. And he asked the beggar if he knew the person in the painting that he just drew. And the beggar looked at the painting, he got shocked, of course. The painting, you know why? Because he didn't recognize himself. Because the artist painted the beggar with a full suit and a necktie. And, and the, the artist asked him, look carefully. Suddenly, it dawned upon him that the guy was actually, the guy in the painting was actually himself. And he asked, is that me? Could that really be me? And the artist replied, that's the man I see in you. That's the man I see in you. The beggar replied, if that's the man you see, that's the man I'll be. And there's a power in belief. A mentor is one who believes in you. He takes time to know you, to help and meet your needs. Number two, your mentor believes in you. If you are looking for a mentor, look for one who is generous. Look for one who believes in you. Number three, a mentor stands up for you. Everybody said, stands up for you. Acts chapter 15, verse 36 to 39. You know, sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they were doing. They are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with, his, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such, Barnabas and Paul had such a, a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and Paul and sailed to Cy Cyprus and Paul took Silas. The missionary work of the church has begun. Barnabas suggested to take John Mark again on the second missionary journey. But Paul opposed Barnabas strongly to take John Mark. Let me tell you why. What happened was that John Mark, in the first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas, uh, and on their first missionary journey, they came to this place called Pamphylia. Uh, you can see this in the, in the, in the uh, slides here. Pamphylia is just south of Galatia. Okay, it's just south of Galatia. And, and this, is, this is near the, the, the sea. So it is a very swampy area. And this is, is mosquito infected when there's still water. There's, it's always mosquito infected. Huh? At that time, when Paul needed, uh, at, at that time, uh, Paul actually contracted malaria. Some scholars actually said that, that Paul contracted malaria. And this is a strain of malaria that actually affected the eyes, okay? Maybe, I don't know, but the doctors will know better. Huh? The eyes, his eyes became swollen and he looked very ugly, yeah? It is at this point that John Mark had cold feet and when he saw Paul, he, oh, monster, you know? Then he ran home, yeah, like a, like a young man because he's a young man, he didn't, he, he got shocked, you know, of his life when he saw Apostle Paul. He ran off and went back home. It was no wonder that Paul did not want to, him to be on the team in the second missionary journey. So Paul, for him, when he was infected and he was having malaria fever and, and eyes swollen, he wanted, he had to recover. He cannot continue staying in Pamphylia and get more infected. So what he did was he went up north. He went uphill. In fact, he went uphill. And, and uphill, there'll be less mosquitoes as well. And so he went uphill to recuperate. And this is, of course, the place called Galatia. Okay? He went uphill and he went to Galatia to recuperate. But being the apostle that he was, Paul, although he, you know, he's a person like, I think he's a person, I'm a person like him, uh, actually. Yeah, you know, very kanchong one, you know. Cannot sit still, huh? Every time must move. Every time must do something. Yeah? So Apostle Paul, even when he's sick, 
and he's trying to recuperate and recover. He cannot sit still. He continued to preach the gospel and he preached and he started a church in Galatia. He planted a church in Galatia. You can find that. That's why he wrote a letter to Galatia when he was in prison. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 13 to 16. And you can tell that truly he had eye infection. His eyes were swollen until, you know, he was afraid that the Galatians will not accept him also. Yeah, let me read it to you. He says, As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you because he went up to Galatia to recuperate. Even my illness was a trial to you. You did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. What has happened to all your joy? So, he wrote the letter to the Galatians because the Galatians lost all their joy. You know? And he says this, I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given to me. He reminded them that he had eye problem. And because of his eye problem, he actually said the love and the joy that the Galatians have, they, they would have even take out their eyes and give it to him, you know. Uh, and, and that's what happened here, you know, he's in Galatians, he wrote. And this is confirmed by Galatians chapter 6, verse 11. Uh, let me turn you to Galatians chapter 6, verse 11. Because Apostle Paul had, had eye problem, he couldn't, he couldn't write letters actually. But the, the book of Galatians and the book of Philemon, Apostle Paul wrote it with his own hands. The rest of the letters like Philippians or Ephesians or Colossians or Corinthians, Actually, he had a scribe to write for him. He had a secretary to write for him. And then he just signed the greetings at the end of the letter. But Apostle Paul, because I think it was very urgent, he felt it was so urgent, he had to write the letter by himself. Only the book of Galatians and the book of Philemon. Look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 11. He says, See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hands. That means he is telling the Galatians, hey, look here, uh, this is very urgent. I have problem seeing. And so I have to write very big letters so that I can see what I write. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hands. The only two letters that he wrote these words were Galatians and the letter to Philemon. The rest of the letters, he just write in the, the greetings part. Okay, so most of uh, Apostle Paul's letters to the churches were not written by him. He had a scribe and he just dictated, you know, yeah, because he had a high eye problem. Okay, and, and Paul would sign off the greetings. You, you go and check yeah, all the rest of the letters you will find in the greetings. He said, these greetings I write with my own hands. So he's like he's signing off. Lah. Yeah, the great partnership between Paul and Barnabas it's actually like Batman and Robin. But it was broken because Barnabas would not let John Mark be destroyed by Paul's discouraging actions and words. And a mentor is one who stands up for you. A mentor, a mentor is one who shields you from being destroyed by discouragement. John Mark went on to make a mark for himself. In fact, you know what John Mark did? At the end, he wrote the Gospel of Mark. You heard of the Gospel of Mark? He was the first Gospel writer and he wrote the Gospel of Mark. And it was, if it was not for Barnabas, I think we would have missed out a very important event in the life of Jesus, the Gospel of Mark. Have you ever considered who was in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus? Remember? 11 of the disciples went with Jesus to the gate of the Garden of Gethsemane. And then after that, Jesus asked three of his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, into the garden, further in with him. And then after that, he left them there and said, you know, pray, you know. Uh, went on and said, watch and pray, you know. And then after that, he went further up into the Garden of Gethsemane and prayed by himself. Was he alone there? Since nobody was there with him, but who was there to witness the struggle 
that Jesus took place that is recorded in the gospel. You must remember, uh, the gospel is an eyewitness account of the life of Jesus. Somebody must have witnessed the struggle that took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. Have you ever considered this? There is a little hint actually that is found in Mark chapter 14. And I want to share with you Mark chapter 14. And that could imply that John was actually there in the Garden of Gethsemane and that he was an eyewitness account. He, he, he must have hide himself and, 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 you know, spied on Jesus when he was praying alone. It can be found in Mark chapter 14, verse 51, to put it into the slide. But you can go and read it, okay? Turn to your, your Bible app, you can see it. Mark chapter 14, verse 51. Let me read it to you, if you don't want to turn. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Oh, what, a, what a description, huh? Mark actually wrote this in verse 51, that there was a young man only wearing a linen garment. He was naked inside this linen garment. And he was following Jesus. And when they seized him, the, the guards, the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, right? When they seized John Mark, he fled. This young man fled. Naked. He, 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 I, I guess he took off his garment so that they, they grabbed him by the garment and then he, he just took out his garment and ran naked, you know. Yeah, it's a, quite a humorous scene. Uh. Uh, but you realise Mark didn't even know who this young man is. What could have happened, I would like to say, was that the Last Supper was conducted in Mark's house. You'll be surprised, huh? The house where the Last Supper was actually Mark's house. Some of the Bible scholars actually thought that it was Mark's house, okay? When he heard the disciples leaving, he quickly, oh, I also want to kepo, you know. So he went and grabbed his linen garment and followed them. And he went all the way to the garden of Je with Jesus and he was hiding and observing everything that was going on. When the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, he was discovered as well by the soldiers and managed to escape just in time. Perhaps he was so embarrassed about his nakedness that he did not identify himself in the Gospel of Mark. Since Mark was the earliest Gospel writer, the, uh, the other Gospel writers actually took his structure and continued and wrote their Gospel according to the account from him. In fact, Apostle Paul himself have to say at the end of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. And he says this, Bring John Mark, because he is helpful to me in my ministry. The same Apostle Paul who rejected John Mark actually admitted in, in, in Timothy later on. Maybe you can turn to the next slide and you'll see it. Ah, some more. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Bring John Mark, because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I think at the end of Apostle Paul's life, because 2 Timothy is one of the last letters that Apostle Paul wrote, and he admitted that actually, maybe I made a mistake. John Mark is actually very useful and helpful to me and my ministry. Number three, a mentor like Barnabas will stand for you. Go and look for one who will stand for you. Number four, Barnabas rejoices over his disciples' success. A mentor rejoices in your success. Go and look for a mentor who will rejoice in your success. Acts chapter 11, verse 22 to 26. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived, I wonder why they of all the apostles and all the disciples, they chose Barnabas to go to Antioch. I guess because he's a very encouraging person. Huh? When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought 
to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for the whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. You know, the controversy between Jews and Greeks actually surfaced in Jerusalem. At that time, Paul was not around. Peter couldn't handle the assignment. And who did they call? They called Barnabas, the encourager, of course. So Barnabas, when he went, he, went, he got to Antioch, he saw the evidence of God's work and was glad. In fact, he was so excited by the work of God amongst the Gentiles that he went looking for Apostle Paul. You need to understand that Barnabas was a very prominent leader at that time. He was like the bishop, but he went in search for an unknown guy at that time, uh, Apostle Paul. That time, Apostle Paul was an unknown guy. Even not named Paul, he was named Saul because he was like, just received the Lord, you know, a new Christian. So, he got Paul to join him and together they taught the church for one year. Why? Because of the time that they spent together, Barnabas knew what Paul's calling was. He knew that the time has come for Paul to enter into the prophetic destiny. And, and what is his prophetic destiny? To be the apostle of the Christian church. And Barnabas opened the door. In a way, it was not so much that Barnabas needed Paul, but it was rather Paul needed Barnabas at that time. Remember, Paul was legalistic, a Pharisee, and over that time spent with Barnabas, the man of grace, Paul was tempered with grace as well. And that is why we begin to see Paul mellow down over the years. And you will have noticed that it started as Barnabas and Paul. It started with Barnabas and Paul. Maybe you can just uh, click one more time. Yes, it started with Barnabas and Paul. And can be found in Acts chapter 12, verse 25. You see, when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John and also called Mark. You must understand, in the Bible times, when they write the scripture, they will always put the leader first. Huh? Right, for example, in SACC, who is the vicar? Reverend Daniel Tong. So when we, we wish somebody's funeral, right, and then we give a bouquet of flowers, I mean, uh, uh, flowers, a wreath, right, you will put there, you know, Reverend, uh, from Reverend Daniel Tong and the staff. Okay? Yeah, same. Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas comes first. Okay? But after Antioch, uh, you will realize Acts chapter 13, verse 42, it became Paul and Barnabas. Yeah? The mentory begin, the, or the disciple begin to excel over the mentor. The mentory begin to excel over the mentor. Fred Smith once said this, a mentor is not a person, next slide, a mentor is not a person who can do the work, who can do the work better than his followers. Actually, a mentor is a person who can get his followers to do the work better than he can. Yes, it is not like... <laughs> wow, battery <laughs> go. I use this one. My battery not low. The microphone battery low. <laughs> it is not like the Chinese Kung Fu master. You know? When the master, the Kung Fu master would teach every stroke of Kung Fu except one so that he can always be sure uh, that and if anybody, any of the disciples go against him, uh, he still got one last trick in his back. But that's not Barnabas. Barnabas would allow Apostle Paul to ex over excel, excel over him. And that's Barnabas, the great mentor. Go find a mentor who will rejoice over you in your success. 
I give you one last thing before I end. He rejoices. Uh, he not just rejoices in your success. Number five, he affirms and encourages you. A mentor is one who en- affirms and encourages you. I want to tell you about a little secret about Barnabas. Acts chapter 1, verse 23. Interestingly, some scholars believe also that after Judas died, after Judas died, the, there were only 10, uh, 12 disciples become 11 disciples. So there were only 11 disciples and they had to go and find another replacement for Judas. And so that's what happened here in Acts chapter 1, verse 23. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Basabas, also known as Justus and Matthias. Actually, some scholars believe that this Joseph called Basabas actually sounds like Barnabas, huh? It's the same guy. Let's us go back to the beginning and find the roots, okay? It was just before Pentecost, Judas died, they cast lots and find replacement. And the Lord fell on who? Matthias. Matthias was the one who was picked. And the one who lost was a guy by the name of Joseph, also called Basabas or actually Barnabas even. Some scholars believe that it was the same Joseph who was later renamed from Basabas, renamed to Barnabas. If so, he was the one who did not get the apostleship. Some, did, did Barnabas feel, if it is really him, huh? did he feel hurt? Did he withdraw himself and lick his wounds? Did he complain and become bitter? Maybe disappointed. Lah. But he did not dwell too much on it. Perhaps that is why he fought so hard for the underdogs. Sold his property. Gave it to the church even. Stood up for Paul when Paul was rejected. Supported John Mark, who was a loser. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. It says here, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the Father of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those who in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. And I believe that it was brokenness that ministered to the broken. Barnabas himself, I think he was broken when he he was not elected as one of the 12 disciples or apostles. I think he was hurt. He was broken. And then he knew how to minister and comfort those who are broken. And so Joseph's name was changed to Barnabas, son of encouragement, to match his character. Number five, a mentor affirms and encourages others. You know, when, when I went to NS, you know, and then I see all my, those days, uh, my time, I think all, all of you, a lot of you are, uh, uh, not in the, uh, in the baby boomer time and also the Gen X time. Uh, we suffered a lot, uh, NS. <laughs> I don't know about you. Uh, I remember my time when I cannot go to Tekong uh, and then Camp 3 is more. Uh, I know what chala chala chala. Camp 3 is Terror Camp, you know. It's called nicknamed Terror Camp. And wow, really gonna suffer, man. The sergeant, the corporal, the, the officer. There's no such thing as welfare officer those days. There's no such thing as, wow, if, if you you gonna ill-treated, you can go and pick up the phone and go and call somebody mean death. What, 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 what phone call number? I also don't know the number. Don't even have a number those days, you know. And we suffer a lot. But you know what? I told myself, I will never, never do whatever these people do to me, you know. Instead, I will do the opposite. I will encourage. I will encourage those. After that, when I became a pilot instructor, you know, I tell you, I will encourage my pilot, pilot trainees to the point that when I run out of date, nah, they, last time it's called R-O-R, uh, ROD, not ORD, uh, run out of date, nah, they, they, they change it to ORD, operational readiness or whatever. Yeah, but I remember it's O-R, ROD. Lah. And, and you know, run out of date. When I, my contract was over, my six years contract, 
you know what? I thank God, man, I was an encourager to all the trainees because after that, I became an insurance salesman. I could sell insurance to all these people. Whoa, I made a lot of money. <laughs> if someone were to change your name and match your character, my friends, today, I hope they can call you mentor. Amen? Yes. I have benefited from my mentor myself. I met Pastor Benny Ho in 1991. You can see there, the date does not tell a lie. Huh? 1991, 23rd of October. I actually, somebody gave me his name and recommended me to him, to invite him. So I was organizing a leadership training uh, for the Methodist Church youths. So I invited him to be the, the main speaker for the youth leadership training camp for the Methodist Church. And then in 1991, December, oh, just December, just a few months later, you know, Pastor Benny recommended, uh, Pastor Benny chose 12 young adults to disciple and mentor. You can see me there next to Pastor Benny. You can see my wife there, uh, Ruth, uh, next, uh, the second person from the, the ladies, a uh, group of ladies as well. So Ruth and I were the two of the 12 of Pastor Benny's discipleship in 1991. He actually first started mentoring people, and that was me and her. We look uh, different, yeah? No tummy. Yeah. And we grew spiritually under Pastor Benny's discipleship. And I tell you, one of the things I learned from Pastor Benny that is really, I was not a reader, you know, reader. Not lay reader, but reader. I, I touch it one, you know. I don't like to read. I, I, you know, I can go through poly, I can go through all level without reading the book cover to cover one. Just go and go through all the 10-year series. And then pass. Go <laughs> say that get my diploma, you know. But I never read any book uh, cover to cover. That's my confession. Yeah? Yeah. Pastor Benny recommended me some books to read. The first book that I ever completed was this book called Applause of Heaven. Yeah, he, uh, he actually said, Raymond, go and have this book, uh, Max Lucado, Applause of Heaven. So I took the book and I read it. Within three days, I completed this book. <laughs> three days! I completed this book. And after that, I said, Whoa, that's an achievement. <laughs> after that, I went to the Christian bookshop and I bought all the books of Max Lucado and started re reading, you know, <laughs> every, every book. And it, that started my reading habit. <laughs> I remember the first time he re re recommended Ruth and I to preach to the youth in Bukit Arang Badesta Church Camp. In Penang, not bad, man. First time become church camp speaker, you know. Yeah, Pastor Benny was preaching to the adults. Ruth and I preached to the, the youth in Bukit Arang. And they flew us, okay. Everybody take the, the bus, but they flew the speakers there. Wow, first time I got treated VIP, man. Fly there. Wow, I was really blessed, lah, you know. And then after that, he, was, uh, he, was, uh, he started opening many doors for the ministry for both Ruth and I. He also gave us a lot of his own resources because he realized, maybe he realized that my preaching is not that great. Nah. Yeah. So he gave me a lot of resources and gave me permission to use his materials freely. He was ready to stand by me and vouch for me when things were not going too well for me. In fact, he was the one who highly recommended me recently to Lighthouse Evangelism one of the mega church in Singapore, and told the senior pastor, I am the one of the best children's pastor in Singapore. <laughs> when, the, when, the, when, when the pastor, the senior pastor, told me what Benny told him, uh, I thought he overrated me. Uh. <laughs> anyway, I got the job. Yeah? And I, I served in Lighthouse Evangelism before coming to SACC in 2021. He was... He also encouraged us to mentor others while he mentored us. And that is why today, Ruth and I have always grabbed every opportunity to mentor someone 
when we look back, we see many of those whom we mentored have gone to even serve as pastors, as pastoral staff in the churches. We can only thank God, you know. If you look at the pictures here, I really thank God. You know, every time I bump into some of these guys, uh, they will, oh, pastor, I must, I must come to you uh, and I must greet you, uh, my mentor. <laughs> I say, please, la, we are co-worker now. La. You even excel better than me, you know. I'm never a senior pastor before. Our friend becomes senior pastors, you know, in, in the different Methodist churches. And, and I, I really thank God for what, I, I can only thank God for what Pastor Benny had done for us, who is our mentor, and for God to use us as mentors to others. My challenge to you today is this. Find a mentor for yourself so that you can be groomed to be a great mentor like Barnabas or Pastor Benny, you know, and then be a mentor yourself after you are mentored. Be like Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Be a mentor to someone who needs encouragement and guidance. It is time that we in SACC take up the responsibility to disciple and mentor our children and mentor our youth and the younger generation. If we don't, we will lose them. Like what in Korea is happening in Korea. We will lose them to the world out there. So let us commit ourselves to mentor the next generation. Let us pray. With every eyes closed, every head bowed, I want to challenge you this morning. If you do not have a mentor, I want you to say, yes, Lord, I take this challenge today. I want to find a mentor. If, you, you, if this is your prayer, Lord, help me find a mentor. If this is your prayer, I want you to just slip up your hand so that I can see and I will pray for you. Yes, I see your hand. Yes, I see many hands all over the room. Hallelujah. Thank God for you. And maybe some of you who are already being mentored and you want to mentor another person. And your prayer is, Lord, show me who I can mentor. If that is your prayer, you slip up your hand. I want to see your hand. Yes, I see your hand. Yes. Any more? Yes, I see your hand. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I pray right now. Father God, you see those hands, those who want to be mentored, those who are looking for a mentor. I pray, God, that you will guide them. You will open their eyes and you will give them the humility to approach the person that they felt who can mentor them and ask that person to be their mentor. Dear God, I pray for those who have put up their hands that they want to mentor another person. Dear God, I pray, Lord, that you give them the wisdom, you give them the strength, you give them, let them become Barnabas, the son of encouragement, Lord. Yes, and dear God, I ask, Lord, that you will do that, Lord, for all these who have taken the challenge to mentor another person. We thank you, Lord, for this time again. You, Jesus. And we ask, Lord, that you bless us so that we can become a blessing to another person. In Jesus' name we pray. Yes, Amen. Amen.